Uh, I'm Andrew Becker, it's, and it's my great pleasure to introduce, introduce tonight's guest. Annie Jacobson is an investigative journalist and author who writes about war, weapons, U.S. national security, and government secrecy. From 2009 to 2013, she served as a contributing editor for the Los Angeles Times Magazine. She is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Operation Paperclip, Area 51, and most recently, The Pentagon's Brain, an uncensored history of DARPA, America's top secret military research agency. Please join me in welcoming Annie Jacobson for a conversation about the past, present, and future of DARPA, the Defense Department's secretive military research agency. Thank you for joining us, Annie. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to begin um, by discussing the, the mission of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. DARPA is, created, is credited with creating the internet, GPS, aspects of virtual reality, not to mention a mind-boggling number of acronyms. <laughs> it is an agency that makes science fiction come to life, or as you describe it, the agency that makes the future happen. Um, for much of its history, this was done in secret, but more and more, that is happening now in, in, in the open. Um, talk to us a little bit about in what ways, how and by whom our destiny and the destiny of future generations is being decided now. Mm -hmm. Well, first things first, I mean, as an introduction to DARPA, uh, consider this, it's the most powerful, most productive, military science agency in the world. And it's also one of the least reported on. So it puts you in a position of saying, well, what has been going on at DARPA and what does that mean for the future? And another thing I think that's important to consider as you look at um, DARPA, they have a press office, sometimes I call it the DARPA advertising agency. They put certain ideas out there about what DARPA is doing and they're usually kind of gung-ho ideas. DARPA does many great things. It of course created the internet, originally called the ARPANET. Because of DARPA we have GPS technology, um, sensor technology. But DARPA's mandate, as was instructed to Congress when DARPA was created in 1958, is to create vast weapon systems of the future. That's the quote. And when I found that quote, I thought, hmm, I must always keep that in mind when I'm researching and reporting on DARPA because that is its job. So everything is about military technology. Everything that it works on is how does this support national security? And that is, of course, a double-edged sword because that which keeps you safe can also harm you. So with that in mind, there Let's start at the origins of DARPA. There's really mm -hmm. two watershed moments that give rise to DARPA. Mm -hmm. One is the detonation of a, the 15 megaton H-bomb, as well as um, the Sputnik launch, and yeah. really the um, off-the-mark estimation by the U.S. of Soviet aggression and capabilities. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit more about how DARPA was created and what its original mission was. Well, I begin the book with this extraordinary explosion, 15 megaton, it was called Castle Bravo Bomb. I interviewed two scientists who were, worked on that bomb, who were there, w that were witness to that test. And I think from hearing their eyewitness testimony about this explosion, you get the real sense right away of like, these are big weapons. And DARPA was created to defend against the weapon which we had created, American scientists. So it begins with this idea of the military industrial complex existing and having a built-in obsolescence, that the weapon we created will pretty soon uh, be obsolete and a new weapon system will have to be created. But the real moment that DARPA began was several years later when the Soviets launched Sputnik. And so Sputnik was just a little 23-inch sphere. And we might say, looking back at history, well, what's so threatening about that? But the Soviets had beaten us into space. And not only that, Sputnik was lofted by an ICBM, and the idea was, well, if, they, if the Soviets can get Sputnik into space, they can also get a nuclear warhead into space and down onto Washington, D.C. real soon. And so DARPA was created literally in a matter of weeks after the launch of Sputnik to make sure that 
we, we, America, were never again taken by technological surprise. And what's interesting, in all these decades since, DARPA has done its job, in essence, because we've never been taken by technological surprise. DARPA has also done its job to create this very powerful, almost omnipotent military-industrial complex that is forever creating new weapon systems once the other, once the weapon systems become public and the enemy creates that same weapon system. And so, I mean, that, that's really a part mm -hmm. of an irony of, mm -hmm. of the creation of DARPA and the Eisenhower administration when it was created. And coming out of that administration, his warning to the American public about being concerned about the rise of and, and the eventual yes. omnipotence of that military industrial complex. And mm -hmm. so, just to take us to today really mm -hmm. quick, in terms of DARPA and its influence and its mission, but really ultimately, who is making these decisions about our future and our destiny? I, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in terms of that military industrial yes. complex. Well, that's, that was a very interesting part of researching the book to learn that um, one of the, you know, DARPA o is, very quickly into the game realized that there were these major national security problems that needed solving. And so they looked to what DARPA called the supermen of science. And these were the Jason scientists. And anyone here, this doesn't look like a, much of a conspiracy theory crowd, but anyone who follows conspiracy theories probably knows that the Jason scientists are often considered right up there with the Illuminati in terms of, you know, people see them as these wizards behind the curtain doing all these kind of bad things, when in fact, I interviewed the co-founder of the Jason Scientists, a physicist named Marvin Goldberger, and he created the Jasons with a couple uh, fellow physicist colleagues in 1960 and advised the Pentagon for decades. And what I found was that the Jason Scientists were remarkably level-headed and, and detached in their assessments. They wrote a number of reports, many of which Goldberger shared with me, declassified reports, many still are classified. But what was interesting is to get the perspective of Goldberger that went like this, which is that the Jason scientists were all physicists who were academics, so they taught most of the time at America's great universities. And then in the summer, they would gather for what they called summer studies, and they would address these great problems of national defense. And you see over the decades the Jasons advising the DARPA this way, and I, and I write about their role in all the different wars, the Cold War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War. But when you come full circle to where we are now, I learned a very important thing. And it has to do with the fact that the, the Pentagon is really moving toward autonomous weapons. And people surprisingly aren't really familiar with this. I mean, there's a, a lot of talk about, wow, what if, when in fact this is dogma at the Pentagon. And you can read about it in their unclassified reports that talk about DARPA's plans and the Pentagon's plans for drones and autonomous warfare, also called hunter-killer drones, through 2038. And when I was having a discussion with one of the program managers at DARPA about some of these hunter-killer drones, the science of which is being pursued in these very sort of spooky areas that involve brain implants and mapping the brain and charting, you know, neurological behavior in brain-wounded warriors. And I was saying, well, I read a report where the Jason scientists do not think this is a good idea. In fact, they specifically advise the Pentagon against moving in this direction. And the program manager, Michael Goldblatt, said to me, well, Jason's hardly relevant anymore. And I said, what do you mean? This is, this is news to me. And he said, well, it's kind of news at the Pentagon, and it just started happening during the War on Terror, where the Jason scientists are being moved out and in their place of power has come a group called the Defense Science Board, who has been at the Pentagon for a while, but their position in terms of advising the Pentagon and advising how DARPA will move forward has changed. And here's the rub that concerned me, is that the Defense Science Board is made up of individuals who are full-time defense contractors. They are not part-time defense contractors and full-time academics. They sit on the boards of these major, uh, whether it's Boeing, Lockheed, General Dynamics, uh, et cetera. And 
they are the ones who are now really advising DARPA how the government should move toward autonomous warfare, which brings up a very important question. And it brings up what you asked about, which was Eisenhower's concept of the military-industrial complex. So if those who are advising the Pentagon how to proceed and which vast weapon systems of the future to create are the very individuals who are responsible for creating and selling those vast weapon systems of the future, then you have that closed loop that Eisenhower warned against. Because over the history of DARPA and with the involvement of the Jason scientists, mm -hmm. there has been time and again where they have given warning, saying this is not an appropriate use of, say, this technology, whether yes. that was utilizing nuclear warfare on the Ho Chi Minh Trail during yes. Vietnam and perhaps other examples. And with that, is, it's almost a, a conscience, and yet, and it seems as if there has been this tension, or there is still some tension within the Pentagon, but beyond that, there is the, the greater need for a, a, an informed citizenry. Can you describe a little bit of, of that tension? Is that tension, yes. it, it's, is it getting greater, or are we seeing the scales tip in, in one way or the other? Well, the tension is really arising from this idea that what the Pentagon believes the best way forward in warfare is, and again, these are unclassified documents. I write about them in the book. I mean, they're available to be read. Some of them are quite long. But it talks about how the Pentagon is moving toward robotic warfare. These are weapons that people know as hunter-killer drones. So whereas now you have a drone that's under remote control, there's an operator somewhere, whether it's Creech Air Force Base or uh, in Washington, D.C., deploying, you know, flying this drone over the war theater, there is a movement that will go toward drones that are self-governing and that can that you can essentially, let's say, and this is a bad version, but you show the drone a photograph and say, go assassinate this guy and report back to me. Um, that's an autonomous drone. The intelligence, the, the capabilities are not there yet, but the Pentagon is very insistent on the pursuit of these technologies. And so you ask about the pushback. Well, I was surprised to learn that much of the pushback is actually coming from inside the Pentagon. So the Pentagon, um, you know, gave out sort of questionnaires to many people from the commanding officers to the drone operators asking what the general feel was about this movement toward um, autonomous drones. And the general consensus was not a good idea. So instead of taking that into consideration and maybe shifting policy, then Under Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter, who's now the Secretary of Defense, sent out this memo which said, let's create a program where we work on robotics and ethics. And so then that was disseminated among the commanding generals, the drone operators, and everybody in, in between to sort of learn that robots could have ethics. And the idea came back, well, no, not at all, because robots don't have morals. And then this is where it got really tricky. So that trail kind of stops, and I was unable to find out what happened next, what the next movement was from the Pentagon. But separately, I noticed that right around this time, DARPA started a new program, and it has to do with trust. And it's called uh, Narrative Networks. It's one of those really innocuous names, the N2 program. And on face value, it's like, DARPA's working with storytellers and anthropologists to try to figure out how people, you know, are influenced by narratives. But another element of the Narrative Networks program works very specifically, and I interviewed the scientist on this program, deals with a chemical in the brain called oxytocin. And that is sometimes called the brain's moral molecule. And it is this idea that this is what humans use as a trust mechanism in their brain. So if you trust someone, you emit oxytocin. A breastfeeding mother, for example, this is in DARPA documentation, emits oxytocin. And so DARPA is now having this program looking into the use of oxytocin and how you can manipulate trust. And again, this is speculation, but one can't help but wonder, okay, the guys at the Pentagon don't like the idea toward auton movement toward autonomous drones. They don't trust drones that have self-government, and let's have a program that manipulates trust. And that's where we get into some of those ideas about, well, what is DARPA really doing? 
What are their goals and how are they achieving them? I mean, it's interesting to see, again, from the evolution of DARPA and its ma original focus, looking at a deterring or at least being able to defeat a, a nuclear attack mm -hmm. and something that is on a, on a global and a, and a large scale. And over the years, how that has come down, it's, it's really kind of been filtered down and focused down more and more almost on the individual. And yes. the idea of, um, of weapon systems going all the way down into a single warfighter. And how do you augment uh, cognition? How do you make that person who is injured in, in warfare continue to fight? How mm -hmm. do you deal with fatigue? It's, it's beyond just the, the, the larger weapon system. It takes us into the evolution, in some ways, of, yes. of humans. Uh, DARPA calls it transhumanism, military transhumanism. But in an interesting way, this is actually part and parcel of the whole movement towards robotics. It's not only making individual warfighters comfortable with robots, it's this idea of coupling man and machine and merging humans and machine. And DARPA is doing that with programs now with uh, what they call biohybrids, which people might call cyborgs. You know, they're able to actually control a rat's through a labyrinth remotely because they've implanted electrodes in its brain. They can do the same with a moth. DARPA in 2014 created a steerable moth by inserting electrodes in the pupa stage of the moth, which then transformed. The wings came out, and the, uh, the, this part of the machinery is now part of the animal system. DARPA is able to steer a moth. And when you ask about transhumanism, and, we, and as I write in the book, it all began in this very interesting moment decades ago. This is actually not new. It was when the Berlin Wall came down, uh, many Soviet bioweapons engineers defected to the United States, and DARPA hired them. A quote from a DARPA director at the time was, we had no biologists in the Pentagon. They were busy having those people like the Jason scientists, supermen of scientists, men dealing with machines, engineers, um, physicists, looking at these big space systems. But suddenly, the idea that biology is important became what was called a thrust at DARPA. And there began this movement to look inside the body, to work with what they call the dismounted soldier, the guy that's walking on the ground. And this led to a whole new umbrella of programs, which is called augmented cognition, which is called, in short, the super soldier program. And it's how to make warfighters smarter than other warfighters, stronger than other warfighters. And again, these you know, are double-edged swords. Many people who are proponents of transhumanism say, why not control evolution? The cochlear implant, the pacemaker being great examples of you know, benefiting man by augmenting the physical body. People who are very against transhumanism say, there's something really wrong with this. I think the reason that, that I like writing narrative stories, as I, as I do in my book, is that I tell it from the perspective of the people involved, and maybe you get to decide what you think of transhumanism. So there are other elements that, that DARPA has very much been on the forefront of. And so it is getting down to, in some cases, how are we changing or how can we change humans? But then it's also mapping humans, and whether yes. that is is uh, with the global war on terror and the evolution of kind of the scientists involved and more of a, a social science uh, approach to mm -hmm. fighting terrorism to also literally humans becoming data points. And yes. some of the programs born out of, out of, DARPA's, um, uh, out of DARPA's own visions. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? And one of the programs, uh, Total Information Awareness yes. and how that's evolved to what has become a lot of news in recent years. So here we're in the realm of what DARPA, or the Pentagon, calls ISR. It's Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. And it's an idea that actually goes back to the Vietnam War when DARPA had its first shift going from these big sort of anti-ballistic missile defense programs to suddenly being sent into the jungles of Vietnam and being asked to create different weapon systems to fight the insurgents, particularly on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And this idea sprang 
forth of sensor technology. And at the time, it was so rudimentary. It was like guys, and I interview these guys in, in the book, you know, that are flying in low and slow over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, incredibly dangerous. In one situation, these guys are shot down, um, and they're rescued in this very dramatic way. Because what they were doing is they're dropping out of the aircraft and helicopters these giant sensors that are like this big. They're kind of shaped like a dart, and they're supposed to literally fly out of the aircraft, land on the ground in a string, and then the electronic information gets relayed up to a helicopter that's flying in a racetrack formation overhead. And then that information gets relayed back to what was called an information center in Thailand, where soldiers are using these new technologies, this is back in 1965, 66, called computers, to try and create algorithms to figure out what these Ho Chi Minh fighters are doing on the trail, where they're headed, what they're going to attack next. I mean, this technology was laughed at at the Pentagon, by the way. But of course, this is now exactly what we know as surveillance, as the big surveillance network that you referred to. And we saw this program again in the war on terror when DARPA ran into a lot of trouble publicly when it created a system called the Total Information Awareness uh, Program. And that was this idea to use sensor technology to monitor American citizens, to look at their credit card transactions, to look at the library books they take out, to monitor who they're talking to, to try and create with computers which are now very sophisticated and algorithms which have gotten much more sophisticated with help from NSA, et cetera, to then use this system of systems to find not the Ho Chi Minh fighter on the trail, but rather the terrorist among us. And so you can see how one technology decades later becomes this other incredible DARPA technology. And that is very much what we have now in the surveillance systems that are going on. So over the course of DARPA's history, there has been, with some of its uh, inventions, with some of its programs, there has been pushback. One mm -hmm. was, this, was this total information awareness that eventually got splintered off into the NSA and PRISM and a variety of, of other yes. programs. Can you recount some of, of the other um, experiences or the other um, uh, incidents in the past that, have, that DARPA has really had to, um, well, has had to either sweep under the under mm -hmm. the carpet or in some ways fix its its public image its image yes i mean after the vietnam war an interesting thing happened um you know, there was, there was this perception that there was a, well, it wasn't a perception, it was a reality that there was a downsizing of the military per se, which there was. DARPA got in big trouble for doing what was called pre-requirement research, for doing, creating weapon systems that were ahead of the time when in fact we needed to be, you know, fighting this war in Vietnam that we lost. And so DARPA was punished. It got kicked out of the Pentagon, that sort of coveted place to be, and sent several miles away, uh, where it is now in Arlington, Virginia. They had a couple moves. But, um, so DARPA kind of got its wrist slapped, and there was a, a moment with many of the people who were there at the time talking about how you know they thought maybe the agency would be folded, but that's not what happened. In fact, the opposite happened, which is that suddenly DARPA got an influx of money, thanks to the Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, who was the first scientist in the Pentagon to be Secretary of Defense. Brown had been in charge of all the DARPA technology during the Vietnam War, specifically the sensor technology. And Brown created an entire industry behind this idea of information technology, behind the idea of nanotechnology, which is the art of making things small, that all of these sensor systems could be shrunken down. And so even though the public perception was that DARPA was in trouble, DARPA had created Agent Orange during the war, so there was a real idea of banishment, and yet, in fact, the agency flourished. And it didn't really become evident until the Gulf War, when we had a Secretary of Defense, then Dick Cheney, who was a real proponent of using technology to win. And the Gulf War was that incredible show of power, um, network-centric warfare, that 
displayed what DARPA was capable of and what you could do to an enemy force if you had technological superiority. But that only worked in that very specific environment. And it certainly didn't work uh, the next war on the horizon, the war on terror, which dealt with urban warfare. So with with these directions that, that DARPA has taken, and some of those been trajectories over, over decades, again, going back to another example out of the Vietnam War was the idea of, of trying to apply behavioral science or some social mm -hmm. science to understand to, or seemingly to try to understand the Viet Cong and right. what was motivating, what was driving them. But mm -hmm. in some cases, it's taken the Pentagon years to yes. appreciate what DARPA has, has concluded or what they suggested. What happened in, in that mm -hmm. case with, with yes. the Viet Cong? Well, I was really surprised, um, like you're referring to, to learn that there were anthropologists hired by DARPA in the war. And that came, um, and again, there's a parallel here with the Iraq war, so I think it's very interesting to consider. Because the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara at the time, was stuck on this question. He actually had a, like the equivalent, the 1960s version of a post-it note in his office that said, what may the Vietnam tick. He wanted to know why these Viet Cong fighters were siding with the communists and not siding with the Americans. And so DARPA set about this sprawling program where it hired anthropologists and social scientists to go into the field to conduct interviews to try and find out what made the Viet Cong tick. And, um, you know, I write at length, and I interviewed the, the lead on that, a man named Joseph Zasloff, and part of why he felt what he told me was so important, because this was a colossal failure. I mean, the Hearts and Minds campaign failed. And Zasloff said that he felt that, you know, when he saw this same thing going on in the Iraq War, because, again, DARPA got this idea, almost like it had amnesia, that, Ar that DARPA had done this during the Vietnam War, got this brilliant idea during the war on terror, hey, let's start a Hearts and Minds campaign and figure out what makes the Iraqis tick. And it was the same story over again and that same failure. Um, so the idea is, is DARPA is investing all this time and treasure, and one would hope that one would at least get experience and be able to say, well, this doesn't work, how do we need to adjust? And instead, it's astonishing to see that same, you know, instead of amnesia, instead of experience, you get amnesia. And it was no louder spoken to me when I read uh, the Army issued a statement when it kicked this program into effect in Iraq. It was, it was called the Human Terrain Program. And on their website, the Army wrote, this is the first time in history that anthropologists and social scientists are being sent into the war theater on a large scale. But no, it wasn't. Ken, with the shift in influence, and it's interesting talking about trying to find the, the, the trust molecule, mm. with the evolution of the influence of DARPA and who or who is influencing DARPA, is this an agency that the American public can trust? On one hand, we, we've gotten this narrative um, from DARPA again and again about what it has essentially given the world. Mm -hmm. Again, the example of the internet or GPS to make sure that we're not getting lost on our way mm -hmm. to tonight's uh, talk. Is with those, those beneficial, uh, those benefits aside, is this an agency mm -hmm. you feel like that we can trust? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the journalist's job is to inform the public, so I try to tell the story straight down and let people conclude. But I'm also mindful of the fact that Eisenhower warned the public against the military-industrial complex and also said that the way to balance that out was the alert and knowledgeable citizenry. And that's why I think it's important, your question which asks about influence. As a whole, I found that all of these scientists that work for DARPA are really amazing scientists working super hard on pushing technology and science in a way and grateful that DARPA is there to fund them. I found that the problem, and this is my opinion and not my um, presentation as much, but I found that the problem 
seem to lie in that idea of influence. And that's where my own position as a citizen kicks in as opposed to a journalist, which is, you know, that, uh, that Eisenhower did warn against this idea of unwarranted influence. And it seems that, you know, when he spoke those words in 1961, the military industrial complex, the defense contractors were just getting started. And now, of course, they are um, omnipotent. And I think that the alert and knowledgeable citizenry has a responsibility to pay attention to this. People always say, well, isn't Congress doing anything about this? No, they're not. But, you know, you can just simply by being aware, by knowing that the people that are advising the Pentagon which weapon systems to procure are the people who are creating them. Because there are certain elements I that you cover in your book where there's ideas of, of how to, to treat the, the injured warfighter, mm -hmm. whether it is with elements of um, brain injury, traumatic brain mm -hmm. injury, um, to even limb regeneration, mm -hmm. which again seems to be going away from the idea of, of creating new weapon systems. N quite but the opposite. But so yeah. what's really yeah. happening there? Well, the limb regeneration lab, I mean, that's super interesting. It's this idea that humans can one day, um, you know, regenerate their own limbs. And when I was interviewing the scientists down at UC Irvine who are working on this program, um, and I said, because I, what I try to do is make science simple, you know, really make it understandable. And I said, but just help me out, like make it really simple. I mean, salamanders can regenerate their limbs, humans can't. How does that work? And um, Dr. Gardner said to me, well, actually, humans can regenerate. We all did. And I kind of looked at him and he said, we all began as one cell and then we were two. And then we were more. That's regeneration. So we have the capacity to regenerate. And w when you look at big science in that way, that these tech guys are taking big science and going small, I mean, that's big. Those are big ideas. DARPA's funding that. Is that a weapon system? No. That is, you know, helping warfighters who lose limbs or individuals who lose limbs in accidents. But the brain programs are very different because my understanding from interviewing DARPA scientists, the brain programs are presented by DARPA and many of them are very classified. They're in the clinical trial stage. It's this idea of implanting neural prosthetics into the brain of brain wounded warriors, so guys who come back from Iraq and Afghanistan with brain injuries injuries, who have cognitive impairment. And this idea that these neural, ne neural implants will help restore their brain functions. And so that is a noble idea, and DARPA has teamed up with the White House on the Brain Initiative to do this. But what many scientists said to me is, there is also something else going on, which is DARPA mapping the brain, and DARPA using this information wi from the electrodes in the brain to learn about how the neural networks work. So that, and this is the idea, um, that long coveted barrier to break artificial intelligence can happen because DARPA has been at the forefront of artificial intelligence since its inception and no one has been able to figure out how to make machines think. And the idea is that these, bra one idea is that these brain chip programs are actually, l will lead the way toward true artificial intelligence, which sinks right up in line with the idea of self-governance in autonomous weapons. So on one hand, sitting here in the San Francisco Bay Area in the mm -hmm. United States, it's, I don't know if exactly comforting, but the idea that we do have some of the, the best and brightest mm -hmm. working on these problems, these questions, mm -hmm. um, how does DARPA then compare to, and, and for our benefit or for the national security, how does that compare with what other countries are doing? What Do you have a sense of, mm -hmm. of the, the level of competition and kind of where DARPA is in making sure that we are not caught surprised? Mm -hmm. I mean, Russia recently said, we have a better DARPA than DARPA. So you can see the competition. However, on balance, no one has ever been able to take the United States by military surprise. And a lot of DARPA scientists ask me, you know, look, before you, um, 
you know, point out the bad in DARPA, don't forget to mention the good, which is that, and they, they cr a couple different scientists would present this scenario. Imagine, you know, if Russia or China or a dark horse like Saudi Arabia were to suddenly announce that they had created the first human clone, which many people are researching, or broken this barrier of artificial intelligence and produced an autonomous weapon. Um, how would you feel as an American then, and wouldn't you say DARPA has failed? So DARPA has done its job. It's just that one must also ask on balance, what is the job of DARPA for the future? Um, well, that's a great uh, point to launch off to some of the questions mm -hmm. that we have gotten from the, the audience. Um, let's start with this one. Um, and going back to the trust question, what, um, what's the best way for DARPA to build a trust narrative with the U.S. public. Is this desirable, um, it, especially if they are ultimately working in the, in the public interest and in, mm -hmm. in for public service? I think for the most part, America does have a trust narrative with DARPA because DARPA's press office is so good at putting information out there about some of the major programs that DARPA does that are um, for the benefit of the civilian population. Um, you know, one example that comes to mind is vaccine technology. So the WHO estimates that when an emerging um, infection arises um, or a disease, it takes nine months to get that vaccine to market. Well, DARPA challenged itself in 2013 to break that model, and it created 10 million H1N1 influenza viruses in one month. So you can see what DARPA is capable of, and I think you know the, the DARPA press office does a great job of getting that, those kinds of stories out so that cit the citizenry is aware of you know, what the agency is capable of. So maybe you can pull back the curtain a little bit in talking about how you went about some of the reporting of this. How did you get mm -hmm. your access to DARPA besides obviously them wanting to put out their own narrative? Mm -hmm. Um, no one had ever done mm -hmm. as comp a comprehensive history of, of DARPA before. Mm -hmm. How did you negotiate that, and why did they give you mm -hmm. access? I mean, DARPA said no to the majority of my requests, um, and that's just not the way you report a book. I mean, you have to go to the scientists that worked on the programs. Um, in all of my books, Area 51, Operation Paperclip, now the Pentagon's Brain, I interview roughly 70 individuals, scientists, engineers, spies, military folks who have unique um, experience in those places and programs. And this book was the same way. So you begin to seek out the supermen of science, so to speak, to ask them questions, and then they are become very helpful, in my experience, putting you in touch with others who worked on those programs, which you then vet through documentation, through FOIA requests, et cetera. But I think you know one of the most hopeful parts about being a journalist and about reporting about these secret military institutions is I find that the supermen of science, the real smart ones, the ones who have spent their lives dedicated toward you know national security issues, um, as they get older, they become very willing to share information. And they stay on top of the programs that they worked on as they become declassified. So maybe the public loses interest in a program that was going on in 1960, but the scientist doesn't because he was responsible for it. And so when someone like myself shows up and says, tell me about the Viet Cong motivation and morale program, that scientist is quick to pull out his documents, now declassified, um, share them with me, and in essence, educate the public about the history of your country. So with the Jason scientists and many other others, there's definitely uh, a, a bit of a revolving door or a lot of collaboration with, with universities mm -hmm. and, and academics. How do you see the, the role of academia in this and at the same time the dependence of academia mm -hmm. on DARPA, mm -hmm. its DARPA relationship, DARPA grants, DARPA yes. funding? 
It's always been interwoven. I mean, some people will call it the military-industrial academic complex. Um, I was surprised to learn that UC San Diego was, in essence, created to fulfill military needs. And its president, uh, Herb York, was the first director of DARPA. Before that, he was the director of Livermore, um, the science director. And so many of these uh, institutions, academic institutions, are there to help foster military science. On balance, think about DARPA, you know, or rather maybe I should say, explain that DARPA as an agency doesn't actually make things, nor does the Pentagon, by the way. But DARPA specifically is known for being this very flexible, very agile organization, free of bureaucracy. At any given time since it started, it has 120 program managers. Those program managers are in charge of individual budgets. DARPA's budget this year is $3 billion, to give you an idea. Divide $3 billion by 120. And then you can see the kind of money that an individual program manager has. That program manager goes out into the field and hires a team at a, at a university laboratory, a team at a military laboratory, some group in industry, and puts together his program that way and actually maintains this extraordinary control and ability to start and stop and start programs as the program manager sees fit. This is absolutely unique to DARPA, and anyone who studies military science knows this is absolutely not the way military science programs work. So is DARPA, with its, certainly with its recent efforts to reach out in the, with DOD, certainly with Ash Carter and talking about mm -hmm. having more of a collaboration or more of a partnership with Silicon Valley, for instance, yes. is DARPA having difficulties remaining competitive in terms of attracting some of those best and brightest? I would say quite the opposite. I mean, everyone I know wants to work with DARPA. And let's go back to the scientists at the Limb Regeneration Lab. I mean, these guys, and I, and because they were close to me, you know, I would, would see them and, and talk at length and had sort of interesting um, lunch conversations about what DARPA meant to this kind of technology. And, and they would say that no one else is willing to fund limb regeneration technology that may pay off in 25 years. DARPA was, and not only that, DARPA uh, would push them. So they, they, these particular scientists had a five-year contract, five million, and they um, said that they did better, more challenging work than they had ever done in their whole careers, almost, you know, on, on balance in that short time, because of what DARPA asked for them, that the standards that DARPA asks for and demands of its scientists are extraordinary. They're willing to pay for it, but the match is in excellence. Um, in other kind of r recent news or in kind of global issues, do you have sense of uh, a sense of how involved DARPA is again with the idea of social science being an integral part of the global mm -hmm. war on terror? How involved is is DARPA in thinking about how to address mm -hmm. the threat of ISIS? Um, I mean, having read DARPA's most recent budget, which happens to be 500 pages of just kind of like line items, so you just get one line of what the program is. But if you read through it and you're familiar enough with the history of programs as I am, you can start to get a sense of, you know, what is becoming a much bigger arena, and it is exactly what you're talking about. There were a few programs I was particularly interested in, classified, but they look at exactly that. I mean, one, and they seem to be specifically addressing ISIS. Um, one of them is called Nexus 7, and it's looking at Twitter and looking at text messaging to try and determine, um, you know, to try and kind of preempt attacks with this idea of learning using these algorithms what, you know, ISIS followers and ISIS soldiers who use Twitter say in their message the subtext of all of that. I mean, this is where you get into incredible, incredibly complex and sometimes questionable ideas about how much can you really know about what is, because the, the, the baseline is normal versus non-normal. Um, how much can you really interpret what is normal for an ISIS fighter? And that, of course, we can never know because those parts of the program are really classified. So 
overall, describe just kind of how nimble DARPA is. I mean, it is obviously constantly looking on to be on the cutting edge or to set what is the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. But with these emerging threats, do they have uh, the uh, bureaucratic structure that causes them to, to not be able to move quickly, or are they, are they a pretty mm -hmm. nimble organization? I think the latter. I think they're extraordinarily nimble, and they move like that. And I, I say that from looking at the way um, the war on terror, you know, played out for DARPA. How they had to, they had to sort of fragment, and they had to look at urban warfare, and they had to look at surveillance capabilities and drone technologies, all at the same time while dealing with these big threats from China and Russia. So, DARPA, you know, seems to be entering into arenas way before the public even knows about them. We learn about something and then we learn, oh, DARPA's already been there and been looking at that. So with that, n not having a lot of um, bureaucracy involved, what kind of oversight? I mean, who has oversight over DARPA? Who else besides and in, in other influences beyond mm -hmm. to make sure that DARPA is always on the right course or on, mm. on a proper course? Well, I think that's the question, uh, you know, that we were talking about earlier, which is who's advising the advisors? Because people sort of have this knee-jerk reaction that Congress must know what DARPA is doing. But if you look at a 500-page document um, and you flip through it specifically, you realize Congress, you know, that's one of hundreds of documents that different congressional committees have to look at. And there's only so much information that can be taken in, which is where I think the real issue is who's advising the scientists. I mean, which scientists are advising the Pentagon about which way to go. If there's any such thing as oversight, I would say that is the moment of, of the critical thinking. Um, going back to to some of the benefits that DARPA has has given society, uh, again specifically ARPANET and the evolution mm -hmm. into into the internet, um, are there other examples uh, or are there examples of say commercial spinoffs mm -hmm. um, and how those those technologies have come into the public domain? I think a great one is GPS technology because everyone knows about it. You know, we all use GPS. That is a DARPA technology. It was a military targeting technology. And it it's amazing how old GPS actually is. I mean, we all think of it as sort of being, you know, 10 years old, but it's not at all. It goes back to the very early days of, of DARPA when it was called ARPA and when satellites went up and this initial GPS um, targeting came into play. Then there was some inter-service rivalries. The Air Force decided, well, we're going to have our own GPS. The Navy said the same. Congress, the Pentagon said, we want one system. This is all very much in secret in the 80s um, as laser-guided weaponry came into play. This GPS targeting technology became super important. Um, and DARPA took over and really created the true, real GPS system, uh, six satellites that were looking at all this. But the thing is, is the GPS is almost too easy to hack into, and the military knew this. So they created a feature within GPS called selective availability. So there was an offset by several hundred feet. So if anyone, and, and no one but the military knew what that offset was. So if anyone hacked into the GPS technology to hit a target, they would miss the target by several hundred feet. Well, in the 90s, um, industry in Europe learned about GPS technology and thought, we got to get in on this business and make it public because they don't care about the US military. Let's make our own system without a select availability feature without that offset and have a huge industry, at which point President Clinton said, oh boy, this is too, to answer your question, this is too important of an industry and America should have that industry and prosper from it. He declassified the program, got rid of the SA feature, and bingo, we all had GPS like that. So just uh, 
kind of over the, the, the whole kind of R&D enterprise across federal government, mm -hmm. DARPA isn't the one and only. There's uh, the intelligence community has its mm -hmm. own agency. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security has uh, an agency as well. And of course, there's the, the, the CIAs are, are back in QTEL. Um, mm -hmm. How do those different entities collaborate? How do they talk? Are they in competition? Mm -hmm. How does that enterprise mm -hmm. function? I mean, they most definitely work together. I think the most interesting one and the one that I know about um, to, the, to the greatest degree is the CIA's DARPA. It's called IARPA. And it was created a few years ago. And for the book, I interviewed one of the individuals who worked on that program from the ground up to set up that. And it was remarkable, given that sort of rivalry between the Pentagon and the agency, that the agency really had nothing but great things to say about DARPA, how this agency functioned exactly as it was supposed to, and how little waste there was. At least that was from the individuals that I spoke to about setting up IARPA. And now IARPA has really taken off. And, you know, they have a website, which is super interesting. Anyone who wants to go there can learn. You know, you see the front, the veil of the programs, and, of course, the real story we'll probably know about in 40 years. Um, mm -hmm. So, with that, it, it, again, there's this this question that keeps coming up about does does DARPA have a conscience? Hmm. Um, and that is, are, are there other examples of research that that DARPA has engaged in where they ultimately pulled the plug on and said we don't want to go down this path for ethical or moral reasons? Certainly not any that I came across, but I don't think it would be in the agency's best interest to report its failures that hadn't become public. So I think it's impossible to know that. But, you know, I mean, it's interesting when that question comes up, does DARPA have a conscience? I mean, individual people have consciences. I mean, that's how it works, and that's why I think it's so important to bring out the stories of the individuals, because you can see how humans have this interplay between what is right and what is wrong. And that really brings to the central organizing question of my book. If there's one question I ask people to think about, it's this. You know, I begin the book with the story of the thermonuclear weapon created. Uh, the scientists actually called it an evil thing. Um, the creation of this weapon against which there is no defense. And throughout the book, I write of a number of experiences where there was almost a launch, but wasn't. And in every single one of those cases, the launch, the error is found by a human. So there's this idea of how important that human with a conscience is, which is why when we come to the end of the book and you learn about artificial intelligence, um, you really have to stop and say, wait a minute, a thermonuclear weapon may be indefensible against, but it can't launch itself. An artificially intelligent robot could launch itself, and against which there would truly be no defense. Um, going back to the, the question of, of that conscience and individuals, one that, of course, has come up uh, again and again in the last few years is, is Edward Snowden. Mm -hmm. And certainly his revelations uh, or the leaks that, that led to those revelations of programs like PRISM, which is born out of that total mm -hmm. information awareness. Um, and Snowden again being in the news today as he just uh, popped up on Twitter for the first mm -hmm. time. Um, do you, how have his revelations affected your research at all? And do you think, um, and this is a little bit um, kind of a broader question that maybe doesn't speak directly to the book, but um, do you think that his actions have, have served or harmed America? Mm -hmm. Everybody has a different role, and everybody decides for themselves with their own conscience, you know, what best suits them and what action they should take. And I think what is inspiring and what is hopeful to someone like myself is that you can have the Edward Snowdens out there who do what they feel they need to do, but you can also have, you know, a very different approach, which is just to read, to uh, maintain a knowledge base about these programs, and to have an opinion. You know, I always say, you vote with your eyeballs. So 
being a journalist and just having that love of of newspapers and news stories, um, people really do, their eyeballs matter. What you read, what you send to your mother or your child, you know, there's a registry of that. And newspaper organizations are aware of what people are interested in reading. And then they hire more journalists to write about those stories. So you have Edward Snowden, you have the desk journalist, and you have all kinds of people in, in between that I would hope make up that alert and knowledgeable citizenry that's so important. Um, so someone who has actually, by the sound of it, uh, been on, um, had some experience with at least some of the, the technologies or how they have been deployed to, to uh, the war theater, um, an audience member who is from Iraq, um, who remembers the Gulf mm -hmm. War in 91. Um, was there any sense that, that Saddam Hussein um, um, had m much awareness at all of the advanced military power that was coming at that time? I mean, again, it mm -hmm. was... It, as, as this person says, the, they were all shocked by what happened yes. during the Gulf War. Absolutely, and I write about this specifically in the book because, I mean, the biggest DARPA or perhaps the most showy DARPA weapon of the Gulf War was the stealth fighter jet. That technology was, you know, performed in secret. And because I wrote about stealth technology in Area 51, because so much of it was tested out at Area 51, um, I attended the actual, the final banquet when the stealth fighter jet was retired, 2009 or 10, I think it was. And the president of Lockheed was speaking about the Gulf War and about the unveiling of the F-117 and how it caught everybody su by surprise. And he said this amazing thing, which was, he said, we had 10 10,000 civilian and military um, individuals cleared on the stealth program, and no one leaked it. And so it did take Saddam Hussein by surprise, and that had a major role in knocking out, you know, so much of any kind of systems, information systems that the Iraqi military would have used to respond to that kind of power. And so from there, it was kind of a downhill slope to the end, and that's why the Gulf War, you know, ended so quickly. Um, I mean, again, so much of warfare now is about information, and mm -hmm. that being um, the weapon that gives that, that, that total awareness to uh, kind of an all-seeing mm -hmm. uh, theater for U.S. Um, fighters. Um, but that's also getting to the point of, of addressing counterinsurgency. Once we have been in the theater, we've gone through shock and awe, let's say, we've mm -hmm. shown our military dominance, how do we move to winning the hearts and minds? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about um, the DARPA influence in creating that a narrative strategy um, for counterinsurgency mm -hmm. and how that is, how that may be, may be utilized. Well, it's certainly a big problem. I mean, I came across a DARPA document uh, sh that was produced shortly after the Battle of Mogadishu, Black Hawk Down, when DARPA suddenly realized that it had to address this idea of urban warfare. And in one of these declassified documents, the scientists were talking, they were actually quoting Sun Tzu, the Chinese military general from 2,500 years ago. And it says right there in the opening sentence of this DARPA document on urban warfare, Warfare, the worst policy is to attack cities. And yet, that is exactly what DARPA faces, what the entire military faces when it's looking at so much of the future conflicts in these urban environments, which are, you know, counterinsurgency environments, which are almost impossible to defend against. And this is, I think, the biggest problem that DARPA won't talk about because so much technology was set up in Iraq. This is one of the great mysteries that I kind of leave w the reader with and having to do with the war on terror, which is that we created, DARPA created an entire system with an enormous amount of money called combat zones that see.
And it was this idea that we would take all that sensor technology that was originally ridiculed in Vietnam, you know, the big things being thrown out of the planes to monitor the ground and visuals and audios. They're now shrunken down to the size of my fingernail. They're set up by military contractors across all the major cities in Iraq. This is during the War on Terror. So that DARPA can see the combat zone. Um, drones flying overhead, everything feeding to those information systems. The idea that you could see where the terrorists are and go after them. But of course it failed. And now so many of those cities that we wired and that we planted this sensor technology in are in control of ISIS. And every time I try to ask anyone affiliated with DARPA and these programs, what happened to all this technology, the answer is no comment. So we have time for one more question, and that is, uh, I guess, a, a, um, a crystal ball question. Mm. What, is the, what is the future of, of DARPA, and what do you see as kind of the next potential big breakthrough? I mean, you know, there's many different things to speculate on, and I write about all of them in the book, but I think one thing that is clear that is, that is, that is non-speculative is this idea of moving toward autonomy and weapons. And the real question is, will DARPA be able to break that barrier of artificial intelligence? Will it be able to create hunter-killer robots that think? But on that idea, keep this in mind. The very first DARPA hunter-killer robot program was actually way back in 1983. And it was actually called Killer Robots. And the motto of the program was, the battlefield is no place for human beings. So I think really the big question is, and I don't have the answer, is if there are no humans on the battlefield, where are they? Um, and that is all that we have for tonight on behalf of the World Affairs Council. I ask you to join me in thanking Annie Jacobson for this excellent discussion. Many thanks as well to you, the audience, for your terrific Thank questions. You. Um, as a reminder, Annie's latest book, The Pentagon's Brain, is on sale courtesy of Books, Inc., and she will be available to sign copies on stage. Good night, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you.